that's true. Consent items, are we pulling anything off? Good. I don't have anything. Okay. So we will go right into general business, real time crime center. Yeah, and I'll pass that to Chief Morris, who then will pass it off to yeah. Lieutenant Tisdale for that presentation. Yeah. I just wanted to, um, I just want to say a couple things uh, really quickly. I know uh, to Tisdale is going to get us in, you know, some more details, um, but, you know, real time crime center can be a real game changer in terms of the uh, situa situational awareness that it provides the officer safety, the community safety. And, um, you know, of course, like with anything else, we have to be intentional and deliberate, you know, in our creation. And so um, I know that he's going to talk about gunshot, you know, as an example of gunshot detection uh software and you know we just need to be make sure it's the right thing for aurora uh, given you know what we're wanting to do um here so um uh you know it's a um you know the main thing being making sure that we have the right staffing the right technology and um you know the right Im implementation um to make it just the, you know what it really should be so with that i'll just you know turn it over i guess maybe looking at ten sale to... yep. morning uh, his, I'm Lieutenant with the Electronic Sports Section. Uh, we can go and head to the next slide. Technology hasn't had his coffee yet this morning. Give us a second. So we're not there yet. When we get there, the first thing I'm going to show you uh, is a short video. This is captured from our mesh camera system. Uh, this is from Sunday, March 5th at about 6.05 p.m. Uh, draw your attention to the black car with the bumper falling off. You can see that those are just shots fired at the red car. So you saw from the video, our mesh camera system works wonderfully. We can capture crimes as they occur. If we have cameras in the area, we can track suspect vehicles. Investigators have a ton of information to help them proceed with their cases. Unfortunately, the people who most need this information, the patrol officers, don't get it till much later. Next slide, please. Purpose of a real time crime center is to integrate all the technologies we already have into one place where they can be monitored to give us efficiencies, situational awareness, and increase our decision making speed. This will undoubtedly improve our response, our abilities to solve crimes quickly, and improve safety not only for our officers, but for every citizen in this community. Next slide, please. Current technologies we already have, CAD and RMS. CAD is our computer-aided dispatching. It's what officers, dispatchers use to receive 911 calls, add notes to those calls, map them, and officers can respond. RMS, our record management system, is that database that has all of those call notes, police reports, traffic stops, all the work product that the Aurora Police Department generates. Our mesh network currently have 67 cameras around the city, most at major intersections, parks, high crime areas, uh, gives us uh, a huge investigative tool to identify suspects and solve crimes. Our LPR system, automatic license plate reader. Uh, this system is the number one investigative tool that our officers and detectives use 
solve crimes. Disproportionate amount of crimes involve vehicles. So if we can get a positive ID on a vehicle, that's a huge lead that allows us uh, to proceed with that case. Our system has been active since 2011. It is beyond end of life. Uh, and technologically, it's unfortunately very outdated. The last three, video analytics, body-worn cameras, and drones. These are new technologies that we now have. Um, we don't use them to their full potential. Um, we would like to, especially with the advent of a real-time crime center, be able to use them more in their functions uh, to help us solve crimes and increase public safety. Next slide, please. This video, um, you can go ahead and play it. An officer aired that a vehicle, a motorcycle, had just eluded him uh, from the area of Overland High School. A member of the electronic sports section happened to be working at their desk, was listening to the radio, had the camera system up, and is able to assist real time with this investigation. The plate that the officer gave dispatch um, didn't come back to a motorcycle. It came back to a pickup truck. So at that point, under normal circumstances, this investigation will be over. We have no way to identify this vehicle, identify this truck. However, our officer is able to track the vehicle as it proceeds down East Mississippi Avenue. Through numerous cameras. And luckily, as you'll see through one of our license plate readers. Through the information provided, we're able to identify the vehicle, identify the driver. The officers are able to uh, proceed with their investigation and put out a warrant for their arrest. Next slide, please. The problem we have today, all these systems require separate logins, separate windows, tedious, it's inefficient, uh, but there is a solution. Next slide, please. Real-time crime center integration software gives us the ability to put all these platforms on a single pane of glass, allowing us to quickly and efficiently utilize them in real time to uh, help our officers. We go back to the example of the shooting on Dayton. If we had this software in a real-time crime center in place, an officer or civilian working in the real-time crime center would see the 911 calls coming in. They can click on them. They could see the notes. It would immediately pull up the closest cameras. They could go back, find the suspect vehicle, immediately relay that information to the responding officers, track that vehicle, providing updates, um, and at the same time, check LPR or other technologies in the area to try to give them real-time information to lead them to a suspect. This particular program, uh, FUSIS, is a game changer and is being used across the nation. Denver, Colorado Springs, hopefully here in Aurora. Beauty of this as well, that single pane of glass could be in a real-time crime center. Staffing doesn't allow. It can be in an officer's NBC or in their department issued cell phone. Next slide, please. One of the huge tools of real time crime center integration software is our ability to stand up. You go back one. To stand up a community camera partnership. Remember the community could either register cameras or integrate cameras with the Aurora Police Department. If you want to register a camera, say you're like me, you have a ring doorbell. You don't necessarily want or need the police department to have access to it. They don't want to see me mowing my lawn, filling my walks. But if there's a crime in my area, 
I would like them to have the ability to see that footage. I can register my camera, say, here's where I live. Here's how you contact me. There's a camera at this location. If there's a crime, we select those cameras. They select that neighborhood, send out an email to you. Hey, look at your footage. If you see something, send it to us immediately. And we have that information. You want to integrate your camera. Say you're a business owner. You have a surveillance system. You want to help out the police department. You could give them access to any or all of your cameras completely up to you. And the police department could, in the event of a crime, go in and look at your cameras. Look at the camera of your parking lot to help solve a crime that's going on there. Say you're a you know, school or a place of worship. You don't want the police to have you know, free reign over your cameras, but in the event of emergency, you'd like that to be an option. You integrate your cameras, turn them off, but at the press of a panic button, or a panic button in an app, the police would immediately have access to your cameras and the ability to see what's going on inside your uh, business in event of an emergency. City of Atlanta, a page you see here, is a good model of something we would like to uh, work towards. We currently have over 30,000 cameras integrated or registered with their real time crime center. Cost of integration software. It's approximately $125,000 a year. Next slide, please. City. Very quickly, uh, this is the heat map for the city of Aurora. For all gunfire related calls of service from January 1st of 2021 to February 15th of this year. Um, there's multiple studies that show between 20 to 25% of all gunfire uh, related incidents do not generate a call for service. Slide, please. Um, this is a, a more close in heat map of Northwest Aurora uh, showing gunfire incidents, assaults, homicides during the same time period. And a general breakdown of advertised pricing uh, between ShotSpotter and Flock Safety for their gun gunfire detection uh, technologies. Next slide, please. Our goal is to stand up a real time crime center. Right now, we would like to implement integration software so that we can stand up something utilizing officers on light duty, whatever staffing that we have at the present moment to immediately impact public safety and provide the best information we can uh, to our officers. In time, we'd like to identify a location and funding to stand up a real time crime center that could meet the needs of our city as we continue to grow and increase the operational capacity. Our goal would be to hire civilians uh, to help staff this facility to uh, keep our resources as much as possible on the street. Excuse me, how big would the facility need to be? I think that would depend on um, kind of how we want to how we want to view it. Some agencies combine it with, you know, one large facility as maybe a traffic operations center, a police real time crime center, an emergency operations center. Some agencies like Tampa have room this size with a video wall, ten consoles. That's what they do. And I'll say additionally too, while I know we talked a lot about the cameras and what the real time crime center people can see on camera, not everything's going to be on camera. There's not going to be a camera they can go to, but let's say my officers are around to a disturbance and there's a named suspect in the call slip um, or a vehicle description um, you know, with a license plate that the real time crime center employees are doing the research. So they're plugging and the, you know, running the name and maybe there's some additional information about that name person that uh, maybe uh, maybe they were arrested, you know, the week before with a gun or something like that. So the officers would have that information. Uh, uh, so even though there's there may not be cameras available, there's still um, valuable information intelligence that um, the real time crime employees are going to be able to provide those officers on the street. Because they're not going to be able to pull over and run the name and 
you know, did something in the call slip or run the license plate necessarily. And the telecommunicators also, um, you know, may not have that opportunity. So there's a lot of um, information they can provide, even if a camera is not available. And then the final slide, there's uh, some additional resources, uh, stories, and just opportunities to see how other cities across the nation utilize uh, these technologies and other to impact public safety. Okay, thank you for this presentation. Um, can I get some comments from you? Yeah, okay. this was uh, just procedurally, uh, this was for informational purposes only. I know there were some numbers in the slide about what the cost would be. Um, Generally, keeping the procedure the same as we come to public safety, uh, we're, this is not an ask, right, as we're saying, but if you all like the idea and want us to move forward with the implementation and trying to get bids and contracts and so forth to bring back to the council, then that would be appropriate. But again, this is for information. There's not an ask here uh, because it's, it's part of the procedural process of the committee. Yeah, right. So, Mike. My thought would be, I would, I mean, I think we need real time crime center. There's obviously lots of gaps, whether it's our mesh program, the license plate readers, um, the ability to detect um, shots around the city. I would like to see, I'm sure my colleagues share this, a plan brought forward with the fiscal note that includes both the one time capital costs as well as the ongoing costs so that we can see exactly what we need and how much it's going to cost to get it done. Uh, that integrates all the pieces that are necessary so that we can, if it's our full all of our colleagues and determine you know what what a path forward is to make this reality. I know there's been a tremendous amount of overtime shortage. Uh, but with vacancy savings, uh, is there a type type of pot growing in that or is it being spent? <laughs> yeah, it's the overtime is is, is, is eating through that, yes sir. Well I know Uh, so for me, I think that this is absolutely necessary being a business owner uh, in this city um, and the businesses that I own. Um, I have cops calling me all the time asking for my cameras because there was a fight or um, there was a crime committed somewhere else in the shopping center. And they, you know, the cops see that I have cameras everywhere um, on my businesses or, um, you know, my one of my businesses was broken into twice in six months. I um, mean, that's in the middle of the night you know and then the cops are calling and i'm getting out of bed to go get my you know turn over my camera footage and so i think this is absolutely necessary but i agree that maybe bring something back that's kind of all-encompassing um so that we can get it to move forward pretty quickly all right so just to give you some direction to staff is move forward with the planning and the cost and so forth and we'll bring back to another do you want to come back to public safety or do you want to go in directly to a work study? Straight to study session. Straight to study session. So, yeah, because okay. I think, and well, I think one of the things that would be helpful is knowing what the costs are because we'll have to identify them, right? right. Um, okay. and, and that's fine, but I, I don't think we have any real sense of both annual and the, the one time cost, the upfront capital cost, and then the ongoing so that we can just try to find a, yeah. where we'd have to cut the budget. Okay. So, all right, um, item 4B, Flock safety presentation. Real quick, I will introduce uh, Ryan Ellswick. Uh, the city, the police department received an unsolicited proposal from Flock Safety uh, for a license, an LPR solution. Um, so I want them to have the opportunity to present. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, folks. My name is Josh. This is Ryan. Uh, we're going to talk about what Lieutenant was talking about just now. So we're from Flock Safety. Um, we know the current reality in America, right? It's true right here, too, as well. It's very difficult, as we just talked about, to uh, solve crime. Uh, there's the nationwide staffing shortages. Crime is rising all over the place. You were just talking about this affecting your businesses. And trust is needed more than ever. Right? We've heard it right here locally that we all need to work together if we're going to actually crack this crime problem. And so that's what we as a company have also seen, and that's what we believe. That's what we built the technology that we build and the way that we do it. We can keep rolling through the presentation. Um, no, noticing that reality, we think there's a tremendous opportunity, one with technology to be one of those things that can help amplify the existing resources that you currently already have. Two is to be able to better capture and distribute that objective evidence. We heard the lieutenant talking about this earlier, but license plate recognition uh, technology can be one of the most important investigative tools for an officer to use because it gives them an objective lead, a real concrete piece of evidence that lets them start their investigation uh, and hopefully unlock the thing that they really need. 
But the last piece of the puzzle is it's actually an opportunity for us to work with the community together. And we're going to show a little bit about how that works uh, right here. Um, so we want to just zoom out real quick and take a, a snapshot of the state of Colorado and then zoom in right here. But we have over a thousand of our devices that are live right now today uh, across the state. And if you look like in this area from uh, law enforcement, having access to these tools to private entities like HOAs and neighborhoods to businesses, uh, universities and schools. We have our technology live in Arapahoe County, Boulder PD, Colorado Springs, Colorado State Patrol is using this technology. Um, Denver, uh, Jefferson County, and as we mentioned, uh, there's nearly 80 private entities that are already using this technology and sharing their footage with police when they can to help solve those crimes. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about is not just the opportunity to increase public safety, but how can we do this in a way that's safe and effective for all the residents of the community? How do we do this in a way that actually increases transparency? Right? One of the things that uh, people, residents of communities often Times will come to the police department and say, well, what technology are you using? How is it being used? Am I being tracked? I don't want like we believe that it's an opportunity for us uh, to share with residents exactly how the technology is being used, what it does and doesn't do, what information is collected, what's not being collected. And I think that's a really important part of this journey with building trust in the community is being as transparent as we can possibly be. And so. Uh, we recommend strong LPR policies, right? We can give tons of examples of those. Um, and that shows, again, exactly to the public how technology is going to be used, what's not going to be used, um, all the different protections that we'll have around data retention and data collection and all of that. Um, if you keep rolling through the presentation, we have a, we built this, what we call the transparency portal. This is a tool that's fully free. It can be just put on your website, the city webpage. Um, and again, it can be updated in real time, but show your residents exactly what technology is being used, how many devices you have, who you're sharing that technology with. Again, what are you using it for? What are you not going to be using it for? Um, and that can really help uh, assuage a lot of those concerns that people may have about technology and police. We all know those common narratives that you see on social media all the time. This is an opportunity for us to help dispel some of those myths and provide more accountability and transparency to the community. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on this piece is that we're really committed to this area. So we have full time staff that are based right here, um, full time uh, installation technicians, full time uh, customer support reps. They're all based here um, in the greater Denver Metro. And the point of that is that we want to be able to respond as quickly as we can. Right? We're here today because we want to be able to help support any conversations or questions that you may have about this technology or how it helps police do their job more effectively. Um, Lieutenant touched on this earlier. But the majority of crime actually does happen with a vehicle. People drive into an area, commit crime, drive out. Um, and so if that's true, we can use technology like license plate recognition to get those leads. And we wanted to share a couple of really quick stories, and then we'll I'll pass over to Ryan and talk a little bit more under the hood about how technology works. Or right down the road, right? 30 miles down the road, Castle Rock. Uh, they posted this on social media uh, last week about the success they had the last week of March. They're pulling pounds of illegal drugs off the streets using our technology. They've recovered dozens of illegal weapons. Um, this is stuff that like uh, law enforcement really needs access to these types of tools. It's not just about the stolen vehicles, although that's a really powerful part of what these tools can do. It's help stop stolen vehicles. So you can see in Castle Rock, they've had a 30% decline in stolen vehicles, but it's beyond just the car itself. It's about what else is being done in these stolen vehicles. And so now law enforcement are able to crack down on these other crimes that are associated with these incidents. Um, I want to touch on this one too. It's not just about stolen vehicles, drugs, and weapons. This can also be a, a community resource tool. So we use our technology. Uh, we have tens of thousands of devices live across the country. Uh, in Akron, Ohio, uh, this is called a silver alert. Uh, a, a missing um, elderly person from the community. She just went missing, and people, her family, did not know where they were or where she was. Please use our technology to be able to identify where she drove, find her, and the chief of police said, without flock, they never would have found this missing woman. And so we have uh, over 75 recorded cases of finding missing people with this exact same technology. And so it's another powerful use case of these sort of tools. Um, the last one I wanted to touch on before I pass it to Ryan is Cobb County, Georgia is a great case study because it uh, looks very similar in size and scope to Aurora in a lot of ways. And so they actually started by doing a pilot project with us back in 2019. They used 13 of our devices in one beat. So the way that a city oftentimes is made up is 
several different precincts where police will work and then a beat in that specific precinct. But that's the way Cobb County does it. So in their one beat 215, they saw a 64% reduction in what they call entering auto, which is breaking into a car and stealing something out of their car. And it wasn't just that they stopped crime in that one specific beat. What they actually saw was they lowered crime rates across the entire precinct. And so sometimes people think, well, it's going to be displacement of crime, right? You stop it in one area, the crime will just move to the other area. What they found is they actually were able to stop the habitual offenders. They were able to actually reduce crime because they were telling the community, don't commit crime here or you will get caught. And uh, we've seen from primary research, the number one way to reduce crime overall is to enforce the law and stop crime very, very quickly. If you can stop it quickly and instantly, you do a better chance of reducing crime overall. So then they expanded. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, through the public private partnership that the lieutenant was just talking about earlier. Um, and you can see how the volume of uh, devices and sensors that they had in their, in their community grew dramatically year over year from neighborhoods, schools, universities, businesses, everybody buying the same technology, then working in conjunction with law enforcement to share that footage. And then the last slide that I'll talk through right now, you'll see that what they saw over the last two years, a 100% clearance rate on homicides. That's what they saw. And they said the credit that the primary tool they used is flock safety license plate recognition technology. 100% clearance rate. The reason that's so impressive, nationally, only about 50% of violent crimes get solved. It's really, really hard to solve crime, as the lieutenant was just talking about, even with all of the sensors and all the networks, if you can't work together and coordinate it all and get the right information to the right person at the right time, it's really hard to solve crime. But when you do it correctly and effectively, you can bring your crime rates down. You can effectively clear every single one of these violent crimes. And that's what we want to bring here to Aurora as well. So I'll pass over to Ryan and talk a little bit more under the hood about how this technology works. Yeah, so uh, the first, we're going to uh, present three solutions in total uh, to you all today. So the first solution is our Falcon fixed ALPR camera. So in major cities, partner with Flock, you know, they're getting objective real time investigative leads uh, through this fixed ALPR camera. Uh, the nice thing about this camera is uh, this version is infrastructure free. So we can put this camera virtually anywhere you want. It doesn't require you to hook it to power. Uh, it works off solar and backup batteries for power. Uh, it doesn't require you to hook it up to internet or fiber. It has its own SIM card built in, like similar to your cell phone. We use FirstNet and Verizon, um, and that's what sends the images up to the cloud for the uh, hopefully the new real-time crime center to uh, investigate um, through our search platform. And then it also sends out real-time alerts to patrol uh, via their MDCs for things like stolen vehicles, uh, felony warrants, suspects, uh, amber alerts, silver alerts, uh, things like that. Um, some things the camera doesn't do, uh, it only captures the back of the vehicle using our proprietary vehicle fingerprint technology. So things that our cameras read in real time uh, through our machine learning is like the type of vehicle, the make, the color, uh, bumper stickers, window stickers, roof racks, back racks, um, as well as state detection, which is really important uh, because it's not going to give uh, Aurora PD false positive reads, which could you know potentially lead to uh, you know pulling over the wrong person. So the characters. On, let's say a Utah plate Matt, are the same as the Colorado plate and the Colorado one stolen, but the Utah one is not. It's not going to flag that as a stolen plate because it is able to read the, the state in real time. Uh, so that's our fixed ALPR camera. Excellent. Uh, and then I was working with Lieutenant Tisdale on this. Uh, this is the second uh, solution we're proposing, which is our Falcon highway camera. We realize that a lot of the roadways in Aurora go uh, three lanes in one direction. Um, our standard camera does two lanes. This camera does three lanes um, at speeds over 100 miles per hour. You can install this camera about 75 to 200 feet from the road, and it'll capture all three lanes effectively. Uh, from what I've seen, I've been doing this about three years, and all the traditional systems out there are, are not capable of doing three to four lanes in one direction. So this just gives you a lot more bang for your buck with one camera uh, to capture uh, three to four lanes in a single direction. And then the third solution uh, we're proposing is called Raven. Uh, so this is our audio detection uh, technology, which uh, specifically relates to gunshots. So this is also an infrastructure free device. It's probably the size of uh, her McDonald's uh, coffee cup there. 
uh, relies on solar for power. We put a, a little small solar panel above it. Uh, you can see the solar panel on the top there as well. Doesn't require internet. Uh, this will alert Aurora PD within about a minute of a gunshot taking place. So they, if, you know, you set up a real time crime center, those alerts, that gunshot alert will go to the real time crime center uh, with the area that that gunshot happened in. And then they can start, you know, dispatching units to that area. And then within about two, uh, two additional minutes, so a total of three minutes, it localizes through triangula triangulation of the devices and approximately gives you where that gunshot took place within about 82 feet. Um, so you can do things like, uh, you know, if there's a body there, potentially save someone's life, uh, collect shell casings for evidence. So that's how this device works. Go to the next one. But really where the true power of the solution comes into play is combining this with our ALPR cameras. So we're the only vendor on the market that does ALPR in conjunction with gunshot te detection technology. So all of our alerts go through the same platforms. So if you had a stolen vehicle, a felony warrant suspect, a gunshot alert, it all flows into the same hot list, which can be accessible through the FUSIS platform. Uh, we have a full integration with them. If you were to move forward with them, uh, we can send alerts to officers, department issued cell phones, their email, or directly through the browser on their MDC for stolen vehicles, gunshot uh, alerts. But where this becomes really powerful is if you were to blanket your city with our ALPR cameras and a ring doorbell photo picked up, let's say a drive-by shooter uh, or a business surveillance camera picked up uh, a photo of the vehicle, or you just had an eyewitness description, you can take our cameras, our system will prompt you to view the nearest ALPR cameras in the area. And if let's say it was a, a blue Honda sedan, the police department could go in and say, hey, show me every blue Honda sedan that was in this area of the gunshot within the last five minutes or whatever the time duration was. And it's gonna show only pull the blue Honda sedans that were in that area. So now you've gone from a drive-by shooting suspect, it was a blue Honda sedan, now you have their license plate, and now the police can do their work to ID that suspect and make an arrest first. Just going out and collecting shell casings and then you don't really have an actionable lead to go off of, of you know, who committed that shooting. Um, so I worked with um, one of our solutions consultants and then Lieutenant Tisdale on mapping this out just so you all can see what this looks like or what this could potentially look like. So on the left side screen, uh, each red pinpoint would represent an ALPR camera, whether that's a uh, Falcon highway camera or our standard Falcon camera just would depend on the uh, number of lanes in that area. And then on the right side, the red icons represent cameras and then the green highlighted box would be a five square mile coverage area of the Raven device sensors that we would place about a thousand feet apart from one another uh, in that entire uh, green box area. So this would give you uh, a full city coverage solution for uh, automated license plate reader technology and then the gunshot detection uh, that we're proposing now would cover uh, five square miles um, in the area of the city where you have uh, gun violence issues. And then just quickly, um, just because everybody asks about the price, um, just kind of giving you the breakdown here. We were proposing 34 of the fixed cameras. Those would cover two lane roads in one direction. Uh, 36 of the uh, advanced camera, which can do three to four lanes in one direction. Uh, it speeds over 100 miles an hour. Uh, six of what we call Falcon Flex, which is a quick deploy uh, camera that the police department could go put up anywhere at a moment's notice. So if you had a, a large event in town, uh, if you're watching a certain problematic apartment complex or uh, the vice unit was watching a certain street or a high drug activity area, they could place this camera up in about five minutes and move it around as often as they want. Um, five miles, five square miles of the gunshot detection and then up to one year of extended uh, data retention, whatever your policy calls for. I think it's 90 days. Our current policy is one year. One year. Uh, state law is three years. Okay. So you would have all the data in the cloud. We use Amazon Web Services. GovCloud uh, would be retained for one year in the cloud. So all the LPR images and then the gunshot detection audio alerts. Um, so Everything included so that we include all the hardware, all the software, uh, installation of all the devices, 
uh, full maintenance warranty. So if any of the gunshot detection sensors or cameras stop working, go down, uh, break, whatever it might be, we will replace those at no cost to the city, to the police department for the lifetime of the contract. Uh, unlimited user licenses, so everyone at the, the police department could have access to this. It's not limited to just select folks. Uh, we integrate with the National Crime Information Center, which is the FBI's national hot list, as well as the CCIC, which is the state hot list managed by State Patrol. So we have a direct integration with those. Uh, we include the LTE cellular, so you don't have to come out of pocket for that. And then unlimited uh, cloud storage through GovCloud. Uh, so it'd be 465,000 annually for everything, uh, which is very competitive. If you look at traditional gunshot systems, you know, you're looking at four or five square miles. You're probably at 400 grand a year, just on gunshot, no cameras, nothing else. Um, so. I'm sorry. And I just wanted to end on one last thing here. Uh, the other thing you give a flock is our team. So, uh, we are here, uh, I run our public affairs group. But we want to help educate the community as much as you all want to do that. So uh, going out to the community, hosting town hall meetings, even just prepping so that we can understand and make it very apparent to everybody. What is the technology? What is it not? Oftentimes there can be misconceptions here. We just want to help educate folks and answer any questions. So we're always available for that. So that's where we wanted to end is say uh, thanks for letting us have the opportunity to speak today. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions this morning or. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Do my colleagues have any questions to start? I don't. We have any right. questions. I think more what, what we want to see is the direction of the PD. Um, so we're here to definitely support and, and back them. So I think it's kind of up to the PD to decide what kind of technology and what, what direction they're they're asking us to ultimately support. Is that fair? Is that yes, what I'd like to hear thinking? some concerns from the boots on the ground, so to speak. Good question. Yeah, I think that goes to being deliberate and intentional in our, you know, in the, in the, in the technology um, that we're getting, whether um, not just um, not just the technology in itself, but which vendors. Um, so we, um, uh, you know, we just need to make sure that we're thoroughly uh, vetted and and um, uh, and more intentional about it. We have to make sure. I mean, this What's is going to be more? this is going to be a big ask, right? So we have to make sure that we've absolutely uh, thoroughly. Better this, but ultimately, this is something I know that the three of us want in this city. So, thank you so much for. Oh, go I, ahead. No, I was just going to say that's okay. Uh, to that point, this goes back to our previous conversation. And when we talk about all the different pieces that are needed for the real time crime lab, all the different technologies that will make it effective, clearly, I think this is one of them. And so, who the, the who provides it is the a separate question, but I absolutely think this, this type of technology needs to be part of it. Yeah. Uh, it has to be in this city, um, but we're going to have to get creative, you know, with that with that funding. So, but it's it's a priority certainly. So, I thank you guys for this thank you. presentation. Thank Those you for your time. Sure. Uh, I think the most important point to drive home here on why, because I work with a lot of major cities across the central part of the country, is why these agencies are partnering with Flock, like Denver, Colorado Springs, the larger sheriff's offices, is because of our network effect. Because we not only work with law enforcement, but we work with K through 12 universities, commercial businesses, a lot of the business improvement districts in Aurora, as well as several HOAs already use this. So getting access to all the other local law enforcement surrounding Aurora and throughout the state, including state patrol, and then all the private businesses, schools that will put these cameras in, you have access, the police department have access to all of that, not just their own cameras. So that's where a lot of the agencies I work with see a lot of success for people that may not live in Aurora that are coming over from Denver or coming up from Castle Rock committing crimes and then fleeing back to their cities they live in. You know, the police department can work collaboratively with those other cities and have access. They all share uh, camera access through the same software. Uh, so that's where we see a lot of success. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to item 4C, police auditor. Is Michelle in here? Oh, there she is.
morning. I am Michelle Crawford, the city auditor, and I'm going to be giving the overview today for the police auditor's first quarter update. So current engagement underway is the calls for service response, and I do continue to work on that engagement. Um, an update on the recruitment for the police auditor position. It is currently in progress and posted to the city's website, so the posting is now live. Um, completed in the first quarter was the firearm evidence process review, and I'm going to be going through that engagement with you today. A little bit of background, the Unified Forensic Lab serves the city of Aurora, Arapahoe County, and Douglas County. The UFL board requested a process review of effectiveness and efficiency of the firearm evidence process or the NABIN process. The review included processes at each agency and the lab. Additionally, the ATF provided some technical support throughout the engagement. Next slide. Thank you. NIVIN stands for the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network and is supported by the ATF. The NIVIN process automates ballistic evaluations and provides actual investigative leads to law enforcement. The turnaround time from when an incident occurs to processing evidence for NIVIN is essential to investigators in solving crime. The graphic up here depicts the average turnaround time provided to me by the lab. This is the lab's data. It was not audited. But as you can see, the average turnaround time for 2022 at the time of the audit included a high of 59 days for NIVIN turnaround to a low of seven days in November after they made some changes. The ATS leading practice is approximately a 72-hour turnaround. So you're looking for ideally best practice, three-day turnaround. Next slide, please. To get into the recommendations, the first is the evidence corrections process. The evidence correction process can lead to delays in NAVIN testing. So during evidence intake, a technician may identify a needed correction, such as a missing signature. The correction notice process currently includes an email to that officer and the supervisor and escalates over 15 days. While an item evidence item is pending, a correction is typically not available for NAVIN testing. Our recommendation is that property and evidence standardizes and documents its procedures for handling officers' corrections, including what can a technician adjust and what does an officer need to come in off the road and make a correction for. Additionally, we recommend updating the notation on correction emails to indicate it involves firearm evidence and to train on those changes to give a higher level of urgency to the firearm corrections. Evidence transports from districts to headquarters can delay evidence processing. Evident Officers can store evidence at each district, and at the time of the audit, property evidence was transporting once a day, Monday through Friday. However, if firearms evidence comes in after that pickup, it's going to sit there till the next business day. Our recommendation was to evaluate options to increase transports, but monitoring those changes to make sure they're actually resulting in a reduction in the processing time. Policies and procedures need updating to reflect current practices. At the time of the audit, the crime unit standard operating procedures were from 2012. And the property evidence SOP for firearms was from 2020 and didn't reflect all of those current practices. Additionally, we identified a need to memorialize in the process and expectations between property and evidence and the NAB and detail officers. Backlogs and other testing areas at the lab can impact the turnaround time, including DNA and latent prints. Our recommendation is for APD to develop procedures for officers and investigators to outline the most common situations in which that additional testing is needed for firearm evidence. So rather than sending every piece of evidence for all three types of tests, when is it most the best case use for that? Staffing levels can lead to delays in processing evidence. Property evidence unit is not staffed 24 seven and the NAB in detail at the time of the audit had two individuals and their testing requires two individuals. So you can have delays in the process. We recommend evaluating the workload schedules and staffing resources for property evidence and the NAB in detail to determine if any changes are needed and if those are feasible. This should include following a risk-based approach and weighing any additional cost and workload changes against a reduction in turnaround times. The lab needs to better utilize and monitor data to identify delays and to address them. The lab needs to break out data by agency and the time between an agency submission and evidence transfer. At the time of the audit, what the lab was providing was a quarterly PDF where all agencies' data was combined. We're recommending that the lab provides that data to the agencies, but then when they receive that, that the police department should use that information to evaluate any delays in their own processes. Identifying performance measures for critical steps in the processes allows performance to be monitored and addressed. For APD, this should include the time between submission of the request and evidence transfer. So when did you submit the request to the lab and when did you actually get them the evidence? 
We recommend that APD sets performance measures for the portions of the processes that they do control and then assigns responsibility for monitoring and reviewing those measures. And with that, are there any questions? So again, the thought of that, because I was getting heartburn, that when you make these recommendations, is there a timeline by which um, they're going to be responsible for? And, and I know you'll usually report back to us, but when going back to the very first slide, when you said what the, the like ideal average is 72 hours, and there were something with 56 days, correct? It feels like we're off a little bit. Uh, so I just want to make sure with all of these that we're there is some timeline. There is somebody who's owns who owns the implementation of the recommendations. So that Correct. For every audit recommendation, we assign a process owner and an approver, and we also assign an estimated implementation date. Sometimes those change, but we do look for updates monthly to quarterly from everyone, and we follow up on every one of those. So APD has the owners established, and they have their timelines established, which all are all through the end of the year. So right now, they're all through 2023 to make those adjustments. Yeah, and I just want to make sure that we continue to have oversight. I mean, I know we're partnered with these other agencies, but from our officers, um, I just keep hearing that it's taking eight months to get fingerprints, um, that, that, that this lab is just moving slower than molasses. And so um, I, if that is the case, uh, which I'm not sure why all of these officers would be lying about that, then I, I, want, I want us to have oversight on that and a say. Yeah, one of the specific recommendations for the lab, so this includes the lab and the other agencies, was to continue to look at their turnaround times and identify ways to be more in a, more efficient and effective because the turnaround times affect each other, right? So if it's stuck in DNA or latent prints, it's going to impact night and you can have that kind of effect. And the other turnaround times that I saw were pretty long. Um, I can let PD speak to that specifically and what they're doing to make some of those updates and changes. Yeah. Bill and I can kind of fill you in on some of the changes that are going on with the lab. We actually made a move, um, you know, made a change of leadership at the lab. Um, Lieutenant DeBoer retired um, and then uh, Lieutenant Rathbun's now out of the lab. Uh, when I came over I, as providing these turnaround times, obviously it's a huge concern and getting this data, this information back is a priority. So whether it's DNA evidence, whether it's fingerprints um, or NIBIN, you know, NIBIN, uh, where there are limitations with having a regional lab to compress that time frame, we're actually going to bring some stuff in house, change our policies and procedures that we should be able to get very close to that 72 hour turnaround. So that's within reach. Um, I say before the end of the year, we should be at that at that benchmark. Um, so we know we have a plan moving forward to get there um, with the, the fingerprints. Some of that stuff's a little bit. Uh, out of our control just because of staffing and getting people hired in there to actually process. We're actually outsourcing um, some of our fingerprints exam examinations to an outside company um, to review those and get them back faster because we just don't have the staff in order to support that. I think we should have uh, 10 fingerprint examiners and how many do we currently have? So right now we're carrying uh, four hard vacancies and one long term. Uh, we have somebody on the administrative. So Carrying those five vacancies hurts to, to just touch on a few things of what is already in progress. Um, the job offer is going out for one of our latent print examiners today. We're, um, when uh, Chief Oates was here, got us on board with a couple more uh, NIBIN techs. Uh, we've got interviews for those going. We also pro uh, prioritize NIBIN in trying to get those investigative leads. To give you an idea, right now, uh, we're actually running about five and a half days. So we've already done some process reviews on, on NIBIN. Now, coincidentally, that just pushes things down for other things like firearms examinations, which pushes our, our dates back. That will course correct as soon as we get um, staffing up and people doing the right jobs. Um, a lot of it as well, this, um, this audit or this review process review triggered a review of the other processes at our lab. So looking at how we streamline it, a lot of it comes down to uh, hitting the nail on the head of communication and training. So ensuring that some of our inefficiencies are also for duplicate requests that really for investigative purposes don't necessarily require submissions for everything. And there might be an order of operations that makes us more effective. Um, that happened with, so with our latent prints, some of the reviews we just started, we were able to clear out about 45 cases 
that were either inefficient, duplicate requests, things like that, that are bogging us down, right? Because then that sets us back. So um, it did trigger some other things for us, and that's what we've been tasked with. Um, staffing has been a concern. We're working with compensation review, some issues there. Um, I think I think the biggest concern actually was uh, leadership is quite frankly the feedback that I was getting. So if there's been that leadership change, that's really all I needed to yeah. hear. But thank you guys yeah. so yeah. much. We'll and work. thank you for that presentation. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right, moving on to item 4D, uh, urinating and defecating in public. And I am the council sponsor for this one. You all been waiting for this. <laughs> um, this was born and Mark's here for you. Okay. Um, this was born, um, the main assignment. <laughs> um, well, you were, but we couldn't charge you because okay, so. this is the house on Alabama, uh, that PD is probably well aware of the city is probably well aware of. We just had to recently condemn this home, um, and get these people out of there. And, uh, Mark, thank you so much for your communication and helping me really understand what the problem was. This city has a current, so I want to hear from you in a minute. The city has a current ordinance that you cannot go to the bathroom in public. However, um, it was written that you can on your own property. Um, and so I, you know, I, we're, we're, we're amending it to, you can still go to the bathroom on your own property in your backyard or any fenced in area. Uh, but this highlighted a humongous problem uh, with transients that had taken over this house. And just to make you guys all aware, this house is right by Utah Park. Um, so a lot of kids, kids riding their bikes. Um, and we have transients walking around with no pants on in their front yard, um, no fenced area, going to the bathroom. This was making me absolutely insane. I'm sure I was making Mark absolutely insane trying to figure out how how do we do this? We had nothing we could we could charge with that. So I am I am changing that. So I don't know if you want to speak to it and, and you want to deal with what PD was having to deal with. Talk about what PD was having to deal with with this. Yeah. So I'll I'll start real quick too, and then I'll pass it over to Sergeant Sears. So um, one of the issues was, of course, as Councilmember Jurinsky stated, as Chair Jurinsky stated, was property of another, right? And so. When we had these issues, and this, and of course, Alabama Place wasn't the only house we've been having these issues. Um, and what was happening was, it was, in, it was happening on the side yards from the house. Mm -hmm. And so, because we couldn't determine who the property owner was, there was no way for us to to use what the statute says. What it said before, it just said without authorization, alters or befouls public property, the property of another, so as to create a hazardous, unhealthy, or physically offensive condition. So, what we've added is. Now is we take out the without authorization. Obviously, if, if the property owner or public, somebody from the public calls in that they're they're viewing this, just says alters or befouls public property or the property of another, which includes but is not limited to urinating or defecating in a public place. Now, it like a public place, but public place is very broad. So we use a definition under state statute. It would include areas between houses. It would it doesn't have it doesn't have to be a large space. Just any group where the any area where a substantial group of the public could have access. Uh, so a fence yard would not be included, as Chair Jarinsky stated, uh, but it would include these issues uh, regarding people being on, even on their own property. A homeowner, if they're urinating or defecating between homes, they would still be in violation of the statute because, again, a lot of people don't like to watch other people go to the bathroom in a public place. Um, I, I just want to be clear, too, because I've, I've already, I've, I've, I've heard, so, I've had some questions already about whether or not that this is targeting homelessness. And it's not because the other statute that we had already could have been used um, with with homelessness people, and the police department doesn't doesn't do that, right? They don't have the resources. We're not excluding anyone. You can, you you, you, can, you don't need to be going to the bathroom. So if that happens to be a homeless, it, person, exactly. But again, it's this isn't adding anything that we didn't already have in our statute. I'm just making that clear. It's just uh, allowing us to tackle the issues that we were seeing at these uh, these homes. Uh, where, these, where these individuals were inside a house they shouldn't have been, but they were not, there was no running water, no sewage, and they were using uh, the side guards for their bathroom. Yeah. Sergeant Sears. Do you want to just know about the history of that house? Well, or? just that this, you know, that this kind of had your hands tied, because I know when I would call you and I would say, well, why can't, I mean, we have video footage, like, you're you talking know, about why can't, but that's okay. Yeah, I was yelling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was like, if I was in this situation, man, she's a lot nicer than I am, than I would be. Um, but it kind of had your hands tied, right? That there, you guys weren't able to charge um, for this. We were able to charge. We were able to charge for various different crimes, but mm -hmm. not the crimes that were happening most frequently, like right. urinating, defecating, yeah. things like that. Right. Okay. And then what what starts transpired? What transpired was is that it created so so many problems. It basically enabled the rest of the criminal population in that area to recognize that it was a place for them to flop, right? So we used every level of force there with the exception of deadly force. So I don't know, and my men did a phenomenal job in, in their discipline and what they did and how they kept records. But what I would like to see, and I would like counsel to, to consider is developing a process that is much more efficient and much more streamlined <clears throat> than having to go almost two years that I was dealing with this property. And then ultimately, thankfully to Mr. Bachelor, we had to get our city acting city manager involved in it and it was done this quick. So there's something that is happening within our systems with not not the police department necessarily, but I think multiple multiple entities within the city need to be able to develop some kind of an efficient process that streamlines this. As I talk to other jurisdictions like Commerce City and Denver and Broomfield, Brighton, even that are like this when they have to condemn houses as they start developing the data that they need from three months they can get it done just from data that they collect so it did tie our hands quite a bit um uh, kudos to ess too because we were able to use some of the cameras that they had that were on the back of the truck so that we could see it real time i could be in my office watching it and deploying my guys uh tactically as we needed to we took stolen cars out of there it was getting to the point to where we were going to start having homicides there that's how bad it was and i'm not exaggerating that at all it was really really bad and i felt bad for the community because the community then started having the fear of retaliation from those people that were inside of there because of the constant narcotics use the illicit narcotics use that was being done there well and pd showed up one time i don't know if you were on that call but pd had showed up one time um and the guy answered the door naked with a sword Yes, that like, was that was almost lunch at PD. So yeah, this um, was interesting. Just made me crazy for sure. Um, but I know I I thank you and and your team, um, you know, for your work on that. But just so everybody kind of understands the history here um, and why I feel this is necessary. You know, they had just taken over this home. An elderly lady had passed away, um, and the transients took over the home. There was no running water in the home. Um, I mean, it just just feces everywhere, everywhere and to be clear when the the lady passed away uh, from there she actually had those were family members that that were actually in that house and we had records of them actually being contacted in that house prior to her actually passing away but all of them that were there were uh special people that just decided to take it to a level that was they rolled her body into a sleeping bag and left her in the house and they terrorized the entire day. Yeah. So just to make perfectly clear and, and, and should this pass out of committee and then, you know, pass through full council, I just want this to go down the channels in, in PD that you guys, you know, will have on this now. Um, I, I just want to make it crystal clear that this is this will absolutely be um, an offense. And if we have some kind of an ordinance or resolution that allows us to be more efficient, I guarantee you that my men will spearhead that and they will be very very effective and, and chair jerinsky i just wanted to add we're also working on the habitability piece to complement this and that pertains to the inside of the home and how a home can be habitable um and so i'm working with pete and angela on that and that will be coming before horns in may so that will complement this as well that's great that's great news. And just real quick i mean one of the one of the things is we we had not i think under the current administration with jim uh, Twombly have, hadn't condemned a house. And so this was new to everybody. We now know as we've gone through this process, it will not take that long. I mean, we should be able to, we know what we need. We know how to, we have the process in place, but it will help Ms. with Ms. Brosser with bringing the habitability piece. So just so the committee's aware, we are, God forbid that we had to do that, right? Condemn a piece of property, but we now have done it and we know what we need to do. Right there too. So the real teeth in this is that a house is condemned and therefore we can move people or is it because they're defecating? So, so, it's a, 
but I'll look so well, back. So this is this is really a behavior, and part of this goes back to how exactly that helps us this build a case. So when we're talking about to condemn a house, house. Yes. yeah, to, to condemn a house, or and what we originally had done is typically we were going after properties as nuisance properties, and that's a very high bar to go something as a, as a nuisance property, and you need lots of different violations, and that does take quite a bit of time. As Pete said, we had not previously uh, approached things from a condemnation and habitability standpoint. So once we had that, once they helped us identify that, we moved forward with quickly identifying that, you know, they had no running water, they had no electricity, they had no other things. And so then we moved quickly to uh, condemnation. This will help us, whether it's on a nuisance property, it's addressing the behavior or on a condemnation. So this just helps us address that behavior uh, for those individuals. And then that will be part of the case that we would build on a habitability. And if this again, at least when I'll have an, an added tool to be able to remove these individuals, take them into custody, take them to jail, uh, to remove them from the house. If this is this activity is happening, the and problem before was the crime. There is what it's going to be disorderly conduct. It's going to be conduct. this change where if they are urinating or defecating around that, because that's what they're doing, right? They're not doing it in the backyard. They're not doing it inside the house because I guess they don't want to make the house smell, but leave a dead body in it. But yes, I'm, sir. it smells really bad. I, I digress, but. Yeah, but it, but they were, we had one of the, one of the houses we were dealing with, the lady had put cameras out and literally this, these people would come out, go to the side yard oh, the neighbors were going crazy. and defecate. I mean, crazy. I mean, they, they, were, they brought toilet paper, paper, but you know, and they were throwing, they were throwing that when they would defecate, they would throw it over, over yeah, the fence yeah. and they were, they were starting to get creative as we allowed them or enabled them or just weren't prepared. They were putting it on like wood and they were signing it. In the in their feces, they were, notes. they were leaving notes. So, yeah, it was it was really bad. People, they were kids, and they, they knew. The yeah, they knew they oh. they knew the law. They they knew that we couldn't. So now we will. So gives police another tool. Yeah, and the final straw was when I threatened to show up over there myself and knock up. Oh man, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so I would ask my colleagues to support moving this out of committee. I'm obviously voting yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your support. All right, so on to the next item. AFR proposed change to Aurora City Charter. Good morning, Chair, Council Members. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Mark Hayes. I work in professional development and personal support with that section of Aurora Fire Rescue. I was asked to give you an informational only presentation on a charter correction request they're gonna be asking of the Charter Review Ad Hoc Committee in May. Um, currently, uh, section 316, subsection 10 of the city charter outlines the procedures for the lateral process for police and fire. It's a 10 sentence uh, section and in it, there's five times that it collectively mentions police and fire. The final sentence of it states, notwithstanding any other provision of this section, nothing in this section should be deemed to prohibit the holding of a lateral only police academy, which effectively does prohibit AFR from doing the same. Next slide, please. Um, and in this, what we're looking at is five times in it, it mentions police and fire collectively. And we kind of have a feeling that that last sentence got skipped or missed when they were doing it in consistency when this was first written. So we we're asking to simply to add two words to that so that that would now read, notwithstanding any other provisions of this section, nothing in this section shall be deemed to prohibit the holding of a ladder only police or fire academy. Next slide, please. And what this would do for us is it would allow us to hold an academy for lateral separate from our entry level academy. Um, we are still required by charter to hire no more than 50% of our hires in a year to be lateral, but it would allow us to be more effective and responsive to attrition changes, staffing changes, and sizings of academy instead of having large academies and large swings in our, uh, our personnel, it would kind of lower the bumps and make it a little bit smoother for our staffing for our department. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's really the simple thing, just two words that we're doing and it's informational. Question. Yes, Council Member. Uh, why would we leave, or why would you wanna leave the 50% requirement in there? And the only reason I ask that is I know that PD is looking to get rid of that requirement. Because, and I know that right now you guys are doing a great job recruiting, you don't have worries about it, but that might not be the case in the future and you might need laterals and then you're gonna be held to this 50%. I mean. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, it'd be great to have that as a goal, but I don't think we should limit ourselves in the future. And so if we're going to make a change, would you want to consider changing that? She doesn't want to just scrap that too, so that there's no cap on the percentage of laterals. Just based on what you need to fill your department. Sure. 
So I think you guys can think about that. I don't think you need to bring that back. Yeah, there's no, there's no legal requirement. Yeah, so, so I mean, whatever you guys feel is best for your- That's a great idea, a great point. Absolutely. And I know the PD, we have, we have talked about doing that as well. And actually one of the discussion points that was sent over was to remove the 15 percent because, right? I mean, having experienced priorities, not that, not that we're gonna ever stop hiring basics, but you know, so that, that, I think that, yeah, I think that'd be a good thing. Chief, you agree? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, next item, photo enforcement pilot program update. Good morning, Chair and Council Members, Lieutenant Kerrigan Bennett, Traffic Section Lieutenant with the Police Department. Uh, information only. So here we are mid-April and we kind of said that we were going to kick this thing off at April 1st and lo and behold, we don't have the photo enforcement program. So we want to provide an update as to what's going on. Um, so on target, the vendor is doing back end updates, getting the databases all ready. Um, the fancy word they use is correspondence. Correspondence is the mailings that you're going to get when you get a violation. So the warnings, the notice of violation and the penalty assessment notices and all the other various things that are going on. Uh, because we council passed the, the ordinance updates this past Monday, we'll be able to move forward with the magistrate program and build that behind the scenes. So we're on target with that. We aren't concerned about that at all. Uh, we just need to identify the city users that are going to be doing all the back end database work. Vehicle delivery and outfitting is has been a bit of a challenge. They had uh, the vendor had a subcontractor that was not able to provide the advanced photo equipment for the, the system. Uh, that has been somewhat corrected. They're waiting for delivery. The we're expecting delivery of all three of our actual vehicles on uh, around May 1st. So that that's really good news. So we'll have all three of our vehicles. I do want to point out that the vendor immediately recognized the problem and bent over backwards to pull a vehicle out of another one of their programs and deliver it here and get it up uh, all set up for us to start using. If we had staff to do it, we'd be able to start running right away. The vendor was really, really good at, at getting getting us an extra vehicle. We have it sitting in our parking lot right now, um, ready to roll, but we have no one to, to staff it, which brings me to number three. So the vehicles will be here May 1st, is that, that that's that's our anticipated, anticipated timeline? Yes, the vendor has the vehicles they have done. So there's two sets of cameras, the front camera and the cabling that goes between the front camera and the back camera is what's delayed out of Germany. They tell me that they should be up and up and running. They anticipate delivery around the beginning of May. Yes, yeah, so delivery the beginning of May. So then what are we looking at now for the program to start? What date? Yeah, uh, next slide, please. So technology wise, program wise, everything on the vendor side wise, we'd be ready to turn this thing on. We could turn it on for the warning period today, but for the fact that I have absolutely no one to run the program. Uh, we are still in the process of hiring and that's been our significant delay. So uh, we'd be ready with our three vehicles around the beginning of May. I anticipate if hiring goes well, I could probably pull off uh, having one vehicle deployed with training around the first week of May. That's dependent on backgrounds, and uh, how fast we can get people hired? Yes, sir. I made the mistake, but did I see some possible legislation at the state level that would change the requirements of this? It could be a civilian that could staff it. Think about that. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. It's coming. Yes, I, I have. I have an update coming, and uh, and ordinance already allows a civilian to staff it. Well, we have a win. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so that's that's the problem. Uh, so one problem is our photo enforcement supervisor. I did make an offer to somebody this week. Uh, she accepted the offer and we're moving into backgrounds. I just pinged HR to find out when we're going to start that process soon. I don't have a good answer for that. I'm hoping for a June 5th start date for that person. We can operate the program without the supervisor. That just means it's more work for me. Uh, we can't use like a light duty cop. Yeah, some, trouble. some broken fingers. Yeah. Someone who is in charge, I yep. don't know. So, concerns with that, um, we, we, we theoretically could. However, if we're taking somebody who's on light duty and potentially physically unable to be a cop, now we're going to put them in a car where they potentially have to act fast to get out of there, right? Because somebody comes up and is complaining about photo enforcement. We have some concerns that they might run into trouble with that. So we'd have to be very, very, very selective about who we would put into the vehicle because they'd have to be able to drive. They'd have to be able to run away. Um, we don't want them actually confronting anybody. But HR and work comp would not. 
put them out in the field like that. There might be a brand new agent. Maybe. Just the we, I think we certainly have in the department that could we, sit. In the we are evaluating some options. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the issue is the training there. The vendor can provide the training, but it's a three full days of training and they can't, they don't have somebody on in Colorado that does the training. So they have to fly people out to do the training. So it's not something that we can do internally. It's not something that we can do on just an ongoing ad hoc basis. Hey, we got in somebody new. So we'd have to identify some people. Uh, and I'm, what I'm hoping to do is get, I have four people in backgrounds right now for the technician spot. Two were a little bit ahead then two are a little bit behind, but with those four people, I'm hoping to get. Three of them on board relatively soon, get them all trained in bulk, and then we can start the process. Would there be an age requirement uh, minimum age for this like 18? It's yeah, it's 18. I think in the, in the job description, um, it's, it's posted out there. We're not looking for a lot of experience, but they do have to be able to drive and have a good driving record and through our background process. Uh, but we are, we are advertising If people are applying. I do have more applications. Actually, as soon as this meeting is done, I'm going to go do an interview for another photo enforcement technician spot. So people are applying. It's just my 1st round of applicants did not clear the background process. So I have, I have new new folks that are through right now, but I should have 4. Uh, moving through, so, uh, that's good news and talking to the vendor. We're okay. We're a little squishy on the, on the time frame, although they gave us the vehicle. It's not eating into their their profits too much. They'll be able to take that vehicle back. We'll get our three vehicles and they're okay waiting a little bit. So we're actually not too far off the mark here. And I think we'll be able to kick this thing off. I think in for May. this too, I think we should um, uh, extend recruiting into the retirement communities. Um, maybe look into like Heritage Eagle Bend, Heather Gardens, like that. See. Um, it's, there's a retiree. That means it, it's certainly out there. And one of our applicants and backgrounds right now is a retired sheriff's deputy. So we're yes, we're we're open to, to open to all sorts, and and anybody who'll come in and interview will move into the background process once they clear interviews. Uh, so I'm I, I was very worried for a while, but talking to the vendor, I think we're actually in a pretty good spot. We're just a little bit off the mark from when we said we were going to start, but technology wise and staffing, I think we're going to catch up and we're going to be able to roll this thing. Uh, next slide, please, which ties directly into that. So timing wise, I think your concern was maybe the timing. Uh, Senate Bill 23200 is the uh, proposed legislation at the state level that talks about an update to the automated vehicle identification system process. Um, that has it's it's going to approach it's getting its first reading appropriations tomorrow. So it hasn't even been it hasn't even been discussed. It's just proposed right now. Uh, so everything I'm going to talk about is extremely fluid at the state level. Who knows if this even makes it past appropriations and moves forward? It may not affect anything. I think there's actually some really good parts in it, the way it's written right now. Um, our process, we've already advertised it on our website and social media. So we'd be in compliance with the law if they turned this thing on right away, because we've advertised it for more than 30 days. We're doing a 30 day warning period followed by an enforcement period. So we're already in compliance with the timing requirements. There's no, no issues there. Um, our process as set in the ordinance that was just passed is already very similar to what they're proposing. It actually eliminates a process server part. So in the proposed ordinance, you violate within 30 days, we'd have to, not we, the vendor would send out a notice of violation. You have to pay that within a certain period of time or request a hearing um, or say that wasn't me driving and, and provide evidence that it wasn't you driving. That's already consistent with our policy. If you don't take any action on that, you get a second mailing, which is a notice of violation, which says you now have to pay us or a penalty assessment notice. You now have to pay us. Uh, which is also consistent with what we were doing. The difference would be a process server versus just first class mail. Uh, the, the proposed legislation would be first class mail instead of a process server. And uh, you're, if you don't respond at all, you're deemed liable for the, for the violation as the registered owner. So if you take no action, you're deemed liable and you're going to get the ticket. Uh, current law does not allow us to do anything more than just send somebody to collections and say, pay when you can. The proposed legislation would actually allow the Department of Revenue at the state level to hold somebody's vehicle registration. So you, you can't register your car or update your license plates and they wouldn't let you sell the car or transfer the title if you had a, a outstanding photo enforcement. And I think the change there is typically that previously had been turned over to collections. And I think that that's one of the issues that this, this is being done at the state law is that I think they're trying to move away from these things being sent to collections. The fact that they're tying it back to the vehicle is 
I think a good thing for getting folks to pay because um, I think that's what's done in other states, and I think that they, they've seen that be more effective. And then you know we get the um, when you're hitting people's credit ratings, I think there's been concerns out there about you know sort of the equity of that. And I think this has been a move to okay, if it's a particular offense, then let's tie it back to your vehicle. So if this goes through, I think it will be hopefully more effective in terms of getting actual compliance. Uh, I also like the move away from a process server because again, there's a state cap on the amount that this uh, of the fine can be, um, but there was also an allowance to recover process servers. And so there became sort of this, I won't call it an urban myth because it was fact, but you had folks that were like, well, you have to get served in person. Well, you just turned your $75 ticket into a $150 ticket because you're now allowed to put the $75 process server on. And so folks would play the game of trying to dodge the process server so that they wouldn't have to pay the ticket, but they're now turning turning it in. So uh, again, it, these are actually good changes um, in terms of those, as, as the lieutenant said. So it's not all bad. So I think it's yeah. Yeah. they're going to they're going to end up adding it to the registration fees. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, a good idea. Next slide, please. So hopefully their car's not stolen. Hopefully they go to the, the register again. Uh, one of the things that I think is the the best thing for the city in the new proposed legislation is the ability to designate certain zones as photo enforcement zones. So today, the example I give here is chambers between Mississippi and exposition. Um, that is a, um, a known spot for speeders. I can't put the photo enforcement vehicles there right now because it's a, the speed limit is higher than 35 miles an hour. So, and also there's some commercial property there, which would take it away from the residential. I can't put a photo enforcement vehicle there. This would allow council to designate certain zones as photo enforcement zones and could say, okay, this is a, this is an area where we know we have a lot of speeders. This is an area where we know we have a lot of crashes. Chambers between Mississippi and exposition is now a designated photo enforcement zone and we can park the vehicles there uh, and do enforcement in those zones as deemed appropriate by the city. So not something we can do today. I think that's actually a, a really good part of the proposed legislation. Um, there's a few other updates in there the, about how the, the compensation can go to the to the vendor based on um, the value of services that they provide versus just the equipment today. They just bill on the equipment basically. Uh, and then a records retention update, but th that doesn't really affect business prop, uh, purposes. If this were to pass today, I don't think we'd have an issue and we'd be able to move forward because a lot of it's just business rules on the part of the vendor being faster with mailing things out. And Kerrigan, just, just one point I think is a little bit tricky with this is going to be at the magistrate process. This legislation proposes um, additional ways that drivers can refute the tickets, the identity, and all of these additional processes that are going to have to be considered in evidentiary hearings. I know that um, the magistrate process we currently have with pros was willing to take this on, but that might be an additional workload consideration for those folks that we would have to consider if this bill does pass in its current form. And, you know, people appealing to the municipal court if, if they don't like the outcome at that stage as well. So just another consideration. Yeah, sure. Can, sorry. Can, can you bring if there's something that we could um, that we should suggest as an amendment? Bring to Pfizer. Yeah, bring it to Pfizer. I, can we get this to come to Pfizer, please? He takes everything else. Can That's we get this to come to Pfizer? That. We would like our city lobbyists to take this. Really needs to go to the Pfizer committee, um, so we can take a position. I'll, I'll which get Council Member Zvonik and I are on, okay. and we can get our lobbyists okay. on this. Yeah, and I, I've been in communication with Liz when this came out and I gave her a heads up. So um, she's aware of, I think, what that concern is. I think most, most of it would be fine. It may also require, even though we just updated these ordinances, for us to come back to council and, and tweak a few pieces of these that are going to change. They would be kind of technical changes with the business practices and then as well as the ordinance regarding what the magistrate process and appeal process would look like. But, you know, we'll bring those changes to council again if they're necessary. And I'm sure you'll love to hear them all over again. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sorry in advance. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Last. Let's fly. Public safety action. Got it. So uh, section one is just uh, crime reduction. So you've got uh, both the staffing numbers in there and then you've also got uh, the Academy class start dates in there uh, in terms of where we're moving through that. So are we moving those back. 
We are moving our most recent class back. We are oh, in police and fire. Police and fire, yes. So we uh, we have transitioned per council's direction. We transitioned backgrounds from civil service to HR that occurred at the end of March. So with that, there's some transition timings. And so uh, taking that over, we are moving back the police academy. You know, Chris ducked out, I want to say three weeks, and I think we're moving back fire two weeks. So, um, yeah, so that's every request for next month. Can we have another column on there that shows where we were with vacancies a year ago? Okay. It doesn't have to be an ongoing thing. I'm just, it, okay. it's good. It looks like we're making progress, but I, for context, that'd be helpful. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions on section one? No. Okay. Section two is, uh, the crime stats. So again, overall, I'll just kind of give you kind of see the numbers in general. Uh, we've had a good start to the, uh, to the first quarter of the year in general numbers are trending in the right direction. They are still way too high overall. But they are trending in the right direction. Um, so with that, any we look over at the division chiefs, anything to add in terms of specific enforcement efforts or anything else you guys want to add? No, I mean we I just looked at the UCR reports. It looks like, like you said, violent crime is trending down. I think having um, our DAR units out there, very proactive out on the streets with um stolen vehicles and stuff, and I think the word's getting out, you know, it's been getting out that we're being very proactive out on the on the streets. Um, investigations has done very well. It's it's solving um, many of these shootings. Uh, we stood up our gun violence suppression team, which is focusing on non fatal shootings. Uh, Grit has had several uh, very large complex cases with um, individuals, and then we've also had a lot of the spike in business burglaries last year, where we had several crews breaking into businesses, hitting the ATMs. Um, we've, uh, the Raven task force filed on a group, um, and then our district detectives, along with, um, some of these had overlapped some robberies with grit. Um, there was some key people we've taken off the street with that. Um, I think there's in just in general investigations, we're filing over 90 cases on about 17 people. And some of those people are still in custody. So I think that's reducing our crime, having some of these individuals off the street. One more request sure. for uh, next month, because <clears throat> it looks like the motor vehicle theft number is down again. Great, it's still okay. too many cars. But one of the things I'd like to see is since the motor vehicle theft ordinance that we passed went into place, okay. what is the overall uh, reduction and what does it look like metro area wide? Is this just a part of a broader trend? Um, I've, I've or, got that. Those oh. stats are in um, the uh, consent agenda item. The, the, the broader one for the the region yeah. it's hard to get okay. so i have to rely on cmat yeah. to give yeah. me that data yeah. and um it, it's in the packet for where it was it's always going to be like a at least a quarter or a month behind but i'll start including that in here also okay. this gives you the top locations of steals and recoveries in the metro area as well as um the stats for um thefts uh, up or down in the metro area um, and Aurora is listed in there as long as uh, Denver, uh, Lakewood, Westminster, and Thornton, and they're all showing uh, trending downward. Okay. Can we also just include a one time update on how many arrests have been made um, on retail theft? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see that data. Yeah. Got both those. The other one, and uh, real quick on this, obviously, in addition to uh, the crime stats, uh, part of that resolution is being data driven. The department has worked very laser focused on getting our crime analysts. There's been some reorganization and a big effort on getting folks hired up. They have a very nice uh, narrative here. I won't read that to you, but again, a lot of effort on uh, getting our crime analysts fully staffed and, and getting that uh, underway. So you've got to read that. Let us know if there's any questions on that front. Uh, on the third item um that is our gang reduction youth violence so sort of yes good morning council uh, a couple things i'll go quick i promise first thing i just wanted to introduce we have our program coordinator andrea wright she started the end of march so you'll be seeing her a lot more she's going to be out in the community she's already hit the ground running um, and is bringing a lot of great ideas on engaging our youth um 
and really some great partnerships that we're going to have with that. So um, update to our RFP for our case manager that has now closed. We're in the review process for that. So that will be moving forward to council for approval, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and then NOFO updates. We ended up with 35 applications, uh, 22 prevention, 13 intervention, which is great. Um, review committee met last week and we're working on finalizing the recommendations that we're going to be moving forward to full council um, in May. So very excited to see that. Um, thank you all for your um, encouragement for agencies to apply and, and kind of keeping that open dialogue. I think um, that really, really helped kind of boost, boost our numbers this year. So um, and as a map, we're over in terms of the funding, so we've got more requests. Correct. Kind of set yes. expectations. Yeah. Significantly more. I think we had a 1.4 million dollar request overall between both. Um, much less based on what the review committee is going to be pushing forward. But yes, we do have more than the five. And so. just on that point, um, I think several of us have made the point. I know Councilmember Lassa and myself. Um, we're we're not necessarily looking to fund all of that. We want to find our key, like our best partners that we can build these relationships with um, through the courts. Judge Day helped me host and you helped coordinate what we just had. Um, I mean, there was three, they were all invited. Sure. There was three that showed up. I mean, that speaks volumes. So I don't care how many are applying. This isn't just a free government handout, you know? So yeah, they went through, the review committee went through a very, rigorous review process, several hours um, of meeting and evaluating every single application on multiple levels um, and, and a pretty, pretty large number kind of dropped off and is not getting moved forward with the recommendations. Okay. So, okay. yep. Um, other than that, I think that's all we've got. We've got some community events happening on the youth violence front starting in May, kick off to summer and, and a few more events happening um, within the community. So we're, we're kind of full steam ahead. Awesome. Okay. Um, uh, item four is crisis response team. Get the numbers there. Courtney, anything to add? Um, so we did just get some great publicity, some press from our partners in the media recently. We just announced our partnership with UC Health more formally. Um, lots of great coverage there. Very exciting to see that. We've gotten a lot of kudos from the community reaching out to us via email, letting us know the great work that our team is doing. I actually just got another one this morning. So. Great stuff there. Our data analyst did start on the 27th. She's been diving into some things to address some of the um, topics and recommendations brought up within the audit. So we're in a really good spot and very grateful for all of the support. Questions on uh, that one. And then uh, finally, uh, the uh, homeless abatement cleanups. Jessica uh, or Emma? Yeah, that's, sorry, I'm short. No, I'm no, I said it's like. Yeah, so you can see we actually did 49 abatements in March, which is, I think, the most we've ever completed in one month. So we're really um, working hard out there and ours working really hard with us to get everything done. Um, and let's see, our uh, pilots have been really successful. We're really getting a lot of people saying yes to going into those. And um, Bryce works really hard to work with folks uh, before we get out there and, and do the abatements, along with our um, contracted outreach teams. So doing really well with that. We've served around 132 folks from um, in the pallets from abatements. So we're getting a lot, like I said, a lot of people going in there and getting services and getting connected. So from that, we've had 12 folks placed in rehab centers, sober living or family reunifications. Um, and again, these are folks who don't typically access resources otherwise. So we're really seeing some good success with this. And um, about seven folks have obtained employment from this as well. And um, we've helped around 115 folks get their vital docs. So again, one thing we see a lot is that folks lose their vital docs in the process while they're homeless in some way or another. And um, so getting those vital docs is a really important first step in getting them back towards housing. And work. And work, yes. And we'll be bringing a one year update from the camping yes. ordinance to study session in May, I believe May 15th, um, just to show all the numbers and all the results from the first year. Now yeah, you guys are doing a great job. Yeah, Emma, you're doing a really great job. Thanks. Uh, day like today is day. How many pallet shelters are vacant? <clears throat> uh, for the abatement ones, it really depends per week. I think this week we had maybe five or six available throughout the week, and it it just depends on when people are leaving, and then they still have to clean the pallets after someone moves out, and sometimes there need to be some repairs. So it really varies week to week and day to day, honestly. 
going and into more of those months. would be helpful. If yes. Going into these summer months, I'm going to be curious to see how many, how many are going and in, in, in taking this help and going into these pallet homes. And if we have more explosions of homeless encampments around the city. I think, I mean, typically you can count on more people being out there in the summer just because the weather's nicer, but uh, the pallet shelters have um, AC in, in each unit. So I, I still anticipate people being really excited to go into them and access that resource. Yeah. Just one quick question. Uh, Jessica, related but unrelated, the grant from the state on the campus. Where yeah, so the amendment is going through the legislature right now to be able to fund more than one navigation campus. Um, it has passed through a few committees. We anticipate that getting signed. We had a call with the state last week. As soon as that gets signed, the state will be issuing a request for applications. Um, and we've been in constant communication with the state. We'll be prepared and ready to apply for that as soon as it comes through. Is that by doing more than one, are they thinking of cutting the total funding in half or? So is it still the 56 million total for two or is it per? It's 50 million total for the region within the seven county Dr. Cog region, um, but they can split that money up. So I believe in our original a letter of intent to the state, we had asked for 27 million to okay. close the gap. And so that way, essentially, they can split it up between a few. And so we're hoping that Aurora will still be, you know, funded pretty close to our ask. Okay. All right, so miscellaneous matters for concern. I just want to wish um, Judge Day and Chief Lanigan and Councilmember Sunberg a very happy birthday. That's why all these donuts are here, and I brought bottles of whiskey um, for them. So on on your way out, please, please grab a donut or two, and um, happy birthday to all of you. And with that, the next meeting is May 11th. And we will adjourn this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't know you I know we've got them, but those are going to chill one of the I didn't know I was out. Yeah, I didn't know.